Hey everybody, welcome to our YouTube channel, our live stream YouTube channel. My name is Glenn Tompkins, Senior Instructor here at VectorVest, and yes, you are here for Trending Thursday. Gal, guess what? I'm not here today, and that's okay, because we've got a great special presentation for you that you can watch, and someone will be moderating the channel if you have any questions, so they can answer as if we were live. If you're brand new to the channel, don't forget to hit this uh the subscribe button, it's important. If your subscribe button is red, make sure you click it, subscribe to the channel. And even as David does his presentation today, hit the like button because it helps our algorithm to get that video out across YouTube land. Most of all, hit the sub hit, not only hit the subscribe button, but hit the bell icon so that you'll be alerted to new content that comes out on a daily basis. So with that, I'm going to miss you this week, but I'm still thinking about you while I'm in Guatemala on my missions trip but enjoy david paul have a great day folks we're getting ready to go over to david paul and he's going to help us uh start off our swing trading stuff uh we got about three or four talks on swing trading so with that we're ready to move over to david and david it, it, he gets into this stuff for real he really does so if you're ready david take it away my friend well good day everyone uh before we start, I would like you to take a moment and to write down or visualize or imagine uh, your best trade over the last six months. And uh, similarly, I would like you to write down or imagine uh, your worst trade over the last six months. Will you do that for me? Uh, and after that, folks, I'm David Paul. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I just wish I was standing in front of you, looking you straight in the eye, not on this contraption. Uh, but uh, my objective uh, is to show you how to go about making smart decisions when you don't have all the facts. Decisions about an uncertain future. OK, and uh, I have a series of slides. Uh, and uh, we are uh, going to go through those. The objective is swing trading success. And uh, folks, every trade involves many, many, many decisions, as you can imagine. Uh, entry point, where do you put your blessed stop loss? How many shares do you buy? How do you manage the trade along the way? Uh, so many, many decisions to be made. And each trade results in fairly immediate feedback in that you make or you lose money. The feedback is fairly quick, but it's actually fairly poor feedback as winning and losing are fairly loose signals of the quality of your decision. And they're very hard uh, to, uh, in fact, learn from. So. Uh, one bet I would I think I will win is that those uh, two trades, the good one and the bad one that you've written down, I can pretty much guarantee, and I've done this for hundreds of audiences, I can pretty much guarantee that the good trade that you wrote down is where you made money and that the bad trade that you wrote down over the last six months is where you lost money. And a really good question to ask yourselves, folks. Did you follow your edge or did you get lucky? And it's my view uh, that trading and life in general, running a business, any form of life is much, much more like poker than it is chess. And chess, fairly, every, everything's fairly quantified. If I beat you, I'm better than you. But in poker, the best poker player in the world can in fact lose and lose a couple of hands to, to, to somebody who knows nothing, who's just by pure luck got a better hand. So that's by way of an introduction. Anyone can place a winning trade, folks. Uh, and uh, to win consistently at the game of swing trading, uh, it's going to take two things. One, a robust, a robust and a well 
tested process. And that's what I'm going to try and present here today. Uh, and the second thing is your ability and the discipline to adhere to that process over a batch of trades. And as I say, a really, really good question to ask yourself in your at the end of every trade, did you follow your process or did you just get lucky along the way? And that takes a great deal of honesty to reach that level of awareness. So uh, this is quite finicky. I, I think that in your trading journal, and I'm hoping that you do keep a trading journal uh, to fully differentiate between the process and old fashioned luck. And the, the latter might be great when Lady Luck smiles upon you, but don't think for a moment that you get rich in that manner. Uh, and if you want to get rich in swing trading and you can get really rich in swing trading, uh, then that will only occur when the process allows you to make quality decisions repeatedly. All the trades will not be winners, but the winners should exceed the loser. Uh, and much, much, much importantly, the amount won should greatly exceed the amount lost. So the first little point is that from now on, I would like you to rate your trades, not just by the amount of money that you've made, but by whether you actually followed your rules or not, to differentiate between the process and old fashioned luck, good or bad. Now my objective today is to suggest a swing trading process for your consideration. It's a process that's been working for me since about 1982. I know I don't look that old. Uh, my goal is to show you how to make smart decisions when you don't have all the facts and feel uncertain about the future. Maybe those 50,000 tanks on the Ukraine border are worrying you. And our objective is to try and stay with the process, not to panic in the midst of the unknown, keeping a calm and collective demeanor. That is your mission. And in my very first job, folks, I was told that we all fear fear. Uh, we all feel fear. It's what you do uh, next that counts. Cheerfulness and adversity was drummed into us as youngsters. So what do I do? Well, uh, I started to trade in October 1982 uh, and I put on my first trade. I was living in South Africa at the time. I put on my first trade in a big uh, company called South African Breweries. It then turned into SAB Miller. It's now InBev, I believe. And it was a winning trade. And I traded while I worked uh, for the beers until 1988. Uh, and uh, then I've been trading full time since that. And over the last 10 years, I've been helping uh, traders and investors in the UK and in South Africa how to actually uh, improve their performance with VectorVest. So I still trade a little bit intraday, mostly the S&P 500. Uh, I was long of it yesterday, did well, well, 25 points. Uh, I haven't got a position today. I've done more intraday trading in, on the uh, index uh, over the last six months than I've done in many years because I'm not traveling. And uh, uh, over the last five or six years, I've traveled extensively in the UK uh, to build up uh, the VectorVest customer base in the UK. And we've got a wonderfully knowledgeable group of investors in the UK. Uh, uh, and uh, so the second thing I do, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, are swing trades that lasts from three to 21 days in both the UK and UK USA stocks. Recently, uh, over the last year, I've been more active swing trading in US stocks because that's where the energy was. Uh, although that maybe has changed. The FTSE's uh, above 7,000 for the first time in a generation today. Uh, so uh, I exaggerate slightly, but uh, it's had a rough time. The world's worst index 
so mostly in USA stocks. And then I have a core trading position, mostly in UK stocks, uh, where the trades last from two to six months. And quite rarely, most of the trades that I've got in the UK market were put on uh, last uh, March. In fact, those of you that come to my Q&A sessions will know the portfolio was called March the 24th because that was the very first market timing signal uh, in the UK. And uh, those positions are, most of them are still running. And then I've got a pension portfolio focused on yield. Uh, and uh, I'm the wrong man to talk about that. Jim Penner uh, at Vector is a much better man to talk about that than I. Uh, so we're going to be talking about swing trades that last three to 21 days. Nevertheless, the setup that I use for my swing trades on a daily chart is pretty much the same setup as I use on a 30 minute chart to actually job the S&P. So. So what do we need to win, folks? Well, we need that process. Uh, the ability to make quality decisions repeatedly when you haven't got a clue what's going to happen next. That methodology has to have a special characteristic. It's called expectancy. It was called expectancy by a uh, trading coach called Van K. Thorpe. He's written a, quite a good book called Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom. And basically, the darn thing has to make more when it's right than it loses when it's wrong. And a part of that, two parts of that expectancy are really important. One is the hit rate, and two is how much you make when you're right divided by how much you lose when you're wrong. Now, at hundreds of seminars, I've played the following game, uh, a coin flip game. I asked people, would you, would you trade with a coin? Everybody shakes their head. I then asked them, well, if you're prepared to bet a pound, dollar, that you can predict the outcome of this toying, uh, coin toss, I'll give you two pounds. Would you play that game? And uh, most people will shake their head and say no. But it's a great game to play, folks, because you should be right five times out of ten. And if you make twice as much when you're right as you lose when you're wrong, over ten spins, you should get five times two when you're right minus five times one when you're wrong. And thus, if you bet a pound on every spin, the average return is 50p, 50 cents. So the first thing that we need is we need a process that we've tested that has got a positive outcome over a series of trades. And that's called expectancy. There's two big parts of expectancy. One uh, is the hit rate and two is the risk to reward. And of course, commissions come in there as well. Very important in the UK. Uh, and we have a half a percent stamp duty that comes in there as well that you guys in the US don't have. And that's why some short term methods and processes that work well in the US just simply don't work well in the UK at all. Uh, the second thing we have to do is to manage our money really well. And that's called position sizing. And I'm going to touch on that towards the end of these slides. It's absolutely vital. If you've got a system that's right 50% of the time that makes a heap of money, let's say it makes four times more when it's right than it loses when it's wrong, which is very typical of a trend following system. Five times four is 20, five times one is five. Thus you make one pound 50 per pound risked. That's a license to print money. But folks, if it's right, half the time, it's wrong half the time. What's the probability of two bad ones in a row? Well, the mathematically challenged struggle with this, but it's a half times a half. So that's one over four. If you start to toss some coins, folks, you'll find that you get two heads in a row every four spins. Gets worse. Three bad ones in a row every eight, four bad ones in a row every 16, five bad ones in a row every 32. If you were to bet 20% of your lift in any one trade, you go bankrupt every 32. 
We don't want that to happen. So managing your money is key. And I think that on all the Victor courses, uh, we suggest that only bet 1% of your look on any one trade. Maybe two. And in Market Wizards, there's a, a guy called Ed Sakoita who's got sort of guru status in the trading community. And he says that anybody who risks any more than 2% of their account on any one trade is a gunslinger. And remember, folks, that that 1% or 2% is the money you lose if the share falls from your entry point to your stop loss. And I'll go through that calculation towards the end of the presentation. But position sizing will keep you alive. And it's frequently forgotten about because it's not that sexy. Entry points are really, really, really sexy. The third thing you've got to do is to manage ourselves. And once you get one or two right, managing yourself is 80 to 90 percent of the process. If you don't believe me, ask anybody who's been anywhere close to a market uh, for more than 10 minutes. They'll tell you that. And ask anybody who's been uh, close to a market will know that uh, we all make really, really, really dumb decisions at times. And there's a very, very good reason for that. And sometimes I think we've been hardwired by the almighty to screw this up. And I'm going to try and show you how to circumnavigate that towards the end. And by the way, folks, this presentation I've spun out into three days many a time. And those of you that don't think I could spin this out into three days don't know me that well. Uh, sticking to that plan is quite something. This is my favorite quote from Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until they get a punch in the mouth. One bad trade, and most people will run for cover, go to something else. Was it the process? Was it luck? I'm sorry, I'm harping on that, but that's really important to differentiate that in your trading notes so that you can learn. So, the first thing I think is Steve has covered, and nobody covers it better than Steve, but uh, we have to line up the probabilities if we wish to get our hit right up to an emotionally satisfying level. Trading a 50% system is really difficult. A cluster of five bad ones comes up frequently every 32 trades. Will you be able to put your trading system into practice perfectly after five bad ones? Really difficult. And that's why, folks, believe it or not, the average trend following system, a technical trend following system, has got a hit rate of about 40%. And I'll leave it to your mathematical skills to actually work out the runs of clusters of bad ones you get in that. My word, you've got to be tough to be a trend follower. If you can pull it off, it's a wonderful way because the risk to reward is huge. Many trend followers get a risk to reward of 15 to 20. But at VectorVest, we want to get our hit rate up. I firmly believe that 70% of the exercise is knowing whether the overall market is rising or falling. And when I first evaluated VectorVest 10 years ago now, 10 and a half years ago, I found that my beliefs about markets and Dr. Bartolino's beliefs about markets were fairly similar in that we firmly believed that the overall market was the key. The most important thing to know is whether the market is rising or falling. Everything follows from that. Now, Steve has covered that, but in the US, uh, we've got a situation uh, where the markets are rising on all time frames. Uh, uh, those of you that have gone into this in detail will know that the buy-sell ratio is not looking that good. Across our side of the pond, we've never been stronger. And uh, the UK market moving up strongly. Shares that haven't moved in a lifetime are moving strongly. Let's hope that we're going to have a, a, a really great time this side of the pond. And uh, remember, when uh, the US market has been trending up strongly, we've pretty much done nothing. And uh, I've uh, stuck with an awful lot of shares uh, in uh, my core positions, and they've finally started to move. We, so we'll be smiling on Monday afternoon at my Q&A session. But 
the overall market should be rising. For my swing trades, I prim primarily use the DEW market timing system. And the DEW market timing system in the US is up since the fourth, uh, since the first of April. Uh, and uh, the confirmed, last confirmed up was on the 8th of April. I'm happy to get in as a swing trader uh, 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 with the DEW market timing system. It's had a great run. Uh, and uh, uh, I think you all know the front page. Steve has covered that. And uh, that's the DEW market timing system. And that's uh, the last uh, green triangle that you can see there is that uh, uh, DEW up that happened on the 1st of April. And this slide's a day or two old, folks, because I had to get the get them across to Joey, uh, our uh, AV guy, uh, uh, timeously. Uh, so it's still going, and we've broken that top. Ladies and gentlemen, we were spoiled. Markets just kept on going last year. And uh, we actually, uh, over the last month or two, we got to a point where which was more normal. So if you have slackened off stops over the last year, uh, just remember that in a more normal situation, you can get a hiding for that. So uh, all is good market timing wise. The industry group is the second part. And uh, as the slide says, stocks tend to follow their industry group up or down. Uh, and if the industry group is trending strongly, that's a great place to look for swing trades. Now, I haven't got time to go into this. In fact, I'm running late already. But if you want to get this easy, then all you really need to do is to watch Glenn on a Thursday, a trending Thursday. Uh, he uh, certainly covers all of the sectors uh, uh, in the US and it covers them exceptionally well. So if you don't want to do that on your own, uh, just uh, make sure that you actually watch uh, watch the recording of Glenn on uh, a Thursday, on Trending Thursday. It's absolutely priceless material. So the third bit is to trade in the very best stocks. And uh, this uh, slide I put into every one of my presentations, uh, Good portfolio management starts with buying the right stocks, stocks that suit your objectives. And in my swing trading, I'm looking for shares uh, that are growing earnings strongly and reasonably safely. And for me, that invariably means that the relative value which is the projected price appreciation potential in relation to a triple A rated uh, corporate bond uh, is above 1.3, 1.4. So a wonderfully unique number relative value. It looks forward, whereas PE looks back. It answers the question, is it better to buy a stock on a PE of 60 or a PE of 10? The stock on a PE of 10, in fact, uh, their earnings could be falling off a cliff. So the stock on a PE of 60 could be a much better buy. And that's brought home to me recently by a friend of mine in South Africa who bought into a company on a PE of five because he thought it was a bargain. He ran his own asset management company. The company went broke on him and his clients ran. Every there's not if you run a <laughs> if you manage money for somebody else and one of your holdings goes broke, my word, your clients, you got to hold the phone out here somewhere and uh, the plastic's melting in your hand. Uh, so uh, RV, uh, an incredibly important number for me as a swing trader, probably the most important number on Vector Vest. I'm happy as long as the RS is greater than one. And uh, in the next slide, uh, this is a lot of lag in this, folks. I'm in West London. It's a beautiful spring day here in the place called Notting Hill uh, in uh, sunny West London. Uh, I've got positions at the minute, uh, and they're all fairly conservative positions. I have a few more since this slide was taken. That was done on the 6th of April. Hortons is going well for me. Amat is going well for me. Apps. 
Any of you buggers selling it at about 85 because it seems to hit, into, hit resistance in the middle 80s. Uh, I'm still holding it. Microsoft, I banked. I banked Microsoft the other day at a Fibonacci target. And by the way, folks, uh, I'm uh, very proud to be a part uh, of a new course that's actually going to focus on when to sell. And I'll speak about that in a moment. But getting out is, is quite an art. Uh, so as you can see, the RVs and these are all great. Uh, and uh, uh, RSs are all great as well, uh, but as long as the RS is above one, I'm happy. This is not worry-free investing, we're swing trading. Uh, if you're swing trading, by inference, you're watching. You're watching and watching closely. Certainly every day, a few times a day maybe. If you're a worry-free investor, your hands off, you want the ball to do the work, that's really important that the RS is high. Uh, so, uh, and I have a search that finds those. Uh, I run, uh, I look at the top 40 by VST, and, and mostly you don't have to look any further than that. Uh, I look at the Midas Touch watch list, and then I have another watch list that I present in the swing trading course uh, called the DEW Swingers, uh, which uh, uh, finds, but the, the top 40 by VST, the Midas Touch watch list, a great place to find swing trades. Uh, the share itself should be rising. And uh, the secret weapon, I call the, the Victor Vest Comfort Index the secret weapon because it saves me hours of work finding shares that are in the throes of a strong trend. Uh, and uh, I used to sit on a Sunday before Vector Vest going through uh, two or 3,000 charts trying to find shares that were trending. The CI does it for me in one click. I also put on three moving averages, 21, 55, and 89. Uh, 21 is exponential, 55 is exponential, 89 is simple for some historical reason that I've forgotten. Uh, and I like to see those positive. I like to be swing trading above an 89 day moving average. The comfort index uh, is a function of the share, the volatility of the share, and the fundamentals. If all three are improving, that scores well. Secret weapon, folks. Uh, I want to buy a pullback. And I want to buy a pullback that occurs in falling volume. So I'm looking for a trend, and I want to buy a pullback in that trend. This is easy. Everybody says buy the pullback. But as the little bugger is pulling back, what are you saying to yourself? This is not a pullback at all. This could be a change in trend. So if you see a market coming back on falling volume, that greatly adds to the probability that the trend is going to resume. So, so far, folks, we want the market to be rising, the DEW to be up. I would like the share to be in a sector that's moving. Glenn will do that for you. I want the share to have solid growth fundamental metrics. I want the technical picture of the share to agree with that. In other words, that it's rising. And for me, uh, the 21 should be above the 55, should be above the 89. Where they all cross, I call that a bow tie. No, not just me. Everybody on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange after Donican calls it a bow tie. He was the guy who came up with these moving out for a fast trend. And I suggested in that area that that was the best time to buy a breakout in a fast trend. So if you see a market that makes a swing low higher than the previous swing high, then as it breaks up, that's a good place to add, a high probability add. That's AMAT. And as you can see, I've drawn my two horizontal lines 
And uh, as you can see by eyeball, there's the 21 and the 55. I haven't bothered put on the 89. And folks, you'll see there are many charts. Uh, I haven't got the moving averages on there at all. That's because if you've been looking at them for the last 25 to 30 years, you know where they are without putting them on the chart. But on this occasion, uh, AMAT, Applied Materials, makes a swing low higher than the last swing high. It then breaks out and it goes. Always a good time uh, to initiate a position or to add to a position. Now, a more normal trend is a pullback to the last swing high. And as we'll see in a moment, I want this pullback to occur on falling volume. So there's a swing high. That's a swing low. And these two levels are pretty much the same. And that is the level. If you ever walk onto an institutional trading floor, the, the traders are paranoid about levels. And the whole morning, let's say before a, a major news announcement, the chaps will be wandering around saying, what's the level, what's the level, what's the level? And then after that, they say, that was the level. That's when you've missed it. OK, that was the level. So those are two things they talk about during the course of the day. Now, this looks easy on a chart, but I assure you, when that's pulling back, every muscle of your body is going to be saying, hey, this darn thing is going to turn on me and fall down the page. Uh, so we don't have to be that strong. We can wait for a candle pattern uh, there to confirm. But when I'm at the top of my game, I buy the level, folks. Buy the level. And my first desk head, Scotsman, I speak to the UK people about him frequently. Uh, and if we had not bought the level, he would have hunted us out. Uh, he used to say that confirmation is for retail traders. Uh, it, the final level, get, get your entry at the level. I don't think you can wait for a candle pattern uh, to add a, a little bit of uh, confirmation to your trade. Uh, and the last trade, uh, the last trend is a creeping trend. And the creeping trend is quite simple. Uh, this swing low impinges on that swing high. Now, if this occurs at best, the probabilities favor the market moving into a, what's called a continuation pattern, or it could be a reversal. So if it starts to go down below uh, that high, then uh, the momentum is being turned. So Dow didn't have flashy momentum indicators. He didn't have any computers. Uh, he worked out fast train, strong momentum is the swing low, uh, is higher than the last swing high. Uh, the normal trend, the swing low, is the same as the last old high, and then a trend that's losing oomph, uh, the swing, this swing low, impinges on the last swing high. And uh, that was a major contribution to technical analysis at the time. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this is the most important chart in technical analysis. And this chart, again, I did for that seminar in Cape Town, way back in the mists of time. I was at the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got a market here. Uh, it's rising, it's making rising bottoms. And I could put my moving averages on here easily. A bull market, the price is rising and the volume is rising. And in a bull market, as the price pulls back, volume dries up. Now, at that turning point, volume is zero. Sometimes you can't see that, but if you've ever traded future intraday, as I have, and for a long time I traded the FTSE 100 intraday, and you could see the turning points where the volume, apart from the rats and mice, one or two is going through, the volume pretty much dried up at the turning point. Now, let's just think through. Let's say that you go out, can you see that? That's a bottle of what I live on, San Pellegrino. 
Let's say that that's selling a Notting Hill for a pound, which it is. Would I pay five pounds for it? Of course not. If the water is available at a pound, only an idiot would pay five pounds for it. But ladies and gentlemen, if the supply at one pound disappeared and I was thirsty, I might pay one pound ten for it. And the reason, ladies and gentlemen, that the prices of anything go up from soya beans to copper to bottles of San Pellegrino to shares is that the supply at the lower price disappears. Anybody who wants to buy it has to pay more for it. So believe it or not, many people out there would say that volume leads price. That is true, but it's the lack of volume that leads price. So just think about that. So this is quite difficult at times because people buy and share, sell shares for all sorts of different reasons. And it can get noisy in here, that's for sure. But if you wanted to push your hit rate up to about 80%, where you rarely get a bad one. If the general market is rising, the share is rising, those moving average are, are intact. The growth fundamentals are there. RV is high, earnings per share is rising, as Todd says in his videos from the bottom left to the top right of its window. And you see the price pulling back and falling volume. That's an 80% trade. However, you would have to be quite disciplined if that was your process, because you don't get that many of them. And they tend to come like London taxis, where you get lots of them, and then you don't see one for a while. But if I want my hit rate up around the 80% level, with the risk to reward of probably about three to one, and I'm happy to sit and wait for them, and I'm at this stage of the game, I'll soon be 66. I, I, I seem to have developed, as my mother used to say, the patience of Job. Uh, so I, I, I'm happy enough to sit and wait for them. If you write eight times out of 10, eight times three is 24. If you have a three to one uh, risk to reward ratio and two times one is two. So you make two pound 20 for every pound rest. You're printing money. But the most important thing is that if you've got a hit rate of eight out of 10, seven out of 10, those darn clusters of bad luck that would drive you to drink if you needed any extra reason go away. Just do the sums for yourself. So emotionally, you're going to find it much, much easier. Being a simple trend follower with a hit rate of five out of 10 will definitely drive you to drink. OK, it's really difficult. There's only a few people who can make that work. If you want to get your hit rate up now, there's some people who can't handle being wrong. Very analytical uh, and want to be right, and I don't blame them. If you want to be right, folks, then you have a lot. Then you need to sit and tick the blessed boxes. And one of the most important boxes uh, is volume. And if you can see volume contracting on a pullback, then you're in a high probability trade. Uh, but you need, you need the market. You need the sector, hopefully. You need great growth fundamentals. The share should be trending the way you want it to go, and you want to buy a pullback, hopefully to an old high on falling volume. If you can tick those boxes, you're going to get very lucky indeed. And that's what I've been doing for a lifetime. Last year was special. 
Last year was special and abnormal because they just kept on going. And uh, I sat in the trading square and the darn thing just kept on going and going and going. That wasn't the case over the last few weeks where we had this in, uh, 10 year uh, yield uh, thing. I see the 10 year yield is falling back down today significantly. So the slide says it. If the share price is rising and strong and rising volume, this is instantly telling us that the price action is being confirmed by the associated volume. Similarly, if the share price is falling and the volume is rising, then once again, volume is confirming price direction. In a bull market, a pullback and falling volume is a high probability sign that it is a pullback and not a trend change. And that's first prize for us as swing traders. Hopefully, that will give you the confidence to step into the ring. Just remember, we all feel fear. The fears are, nobody's gonna slit your throat, but one, being wrong. That's a huge fear. Two, what's the second one? Losing money. Missing out, leaving money on the table. Now, those two fears of being wrong and losing money, I can pretty much guarantee that all men over 50 are less scared of death than they are about being wrong or losing money. So those are huge fears. So hopefully, if you can spot volume. Now, there are many people who have tried to quantify this. Uh, and uh, this is, if you want to do research on this, the chap who's done most work is a guy called Richard Arms. And there's an arms index out there. There's a knees and movement index out there. I haven't found them much use because he's tried to average out volume. And to me, that gets rid of what you're looking at. It's not sensitive enough. So for me, I, I just rely on eyeballing it. Uh, and as I say here, volume reveals the truth about price action. The big guys, can fade the market, they can push it pretty much where they want, but they find it very difficult to hide the tracks of volume. And I took this from the father of volume analysis, a gentleman by the name of Richard Wyckoff. And uh, those of you that uh, have done my work or listened to the Q and A's will be pretty much sick of listening <laughs> about Richard Wyckoff. Uh, but on this slide, uh, this slide, guys, okay, I had the artist tarted up with the uh, color, but the slide's 100 years old. Uh, There's a, a market going nowhere, and it breaks. And it breaks, as you can see, on rising volume. That's good. And then it pulls back and kisses. Now, this is a normal trend. That's resistance. It pulls back and kisses that level. And as it pulls back, folks, volume dries up. When it goes again, volume rises. When it pulls back, volume dries up. That's all it is. Sometimes there's a great deal of noise and you can't see it. I think if you line up all the vector S metrics that I spoke about, minus volume, you can get a 66% hit rate. If you put volume into the mix, you can push that through the roof. So that's up to you. If you're a perfectionist and you don't want many bad trades, and you've got the discipline to sit on your hands and wait for those trades to come along, then uh, by developing some expertise, in looking at volume, you can certainly do that. And just remember, when you've developed that expertise, you've got something that nobody can take away from you. No algo can take it away. But it's really, really important that you line up all the parameters. The vector vest market timing. Shares with great vector vest growth metrics that are rising. CI is good, 21.55, 89 is good. Uh, and then you want to see a pullback to an old high probably. Uh, and that pullback should happen on falling volume. Remember, the only way that I will pay one pound ten pence for a bottle of San Peregrino this afternoon is if the supply at one pound goes away. If the supply at one pound is there, I'll buy it at a pound. So this is Zoom. God bless it. We spend half our lives on the bloody thing. 
Uh, look at this big push up here. This was an earnings push on big volume. Now, that's good. I didn't buy into it here. And then all of a sudden it runs up here on great volume. And then it goes into this triangle. Now, in our precision swing trading course, uh, Steve handles triangles, love triangles. Uh, and there's the 21 and the 55. The 89 is down here. That's good. The growth fundamentals were outstanding. And it broke the triangle. It pulled back, went sideways on virtually no volume. Look at that as it broke. And then we got big up days. So that's it coming together. Uh, that's Neo. And these are really great slides. And this day, that was a great trade for me. Again, runs up on big volume. Pulls back on virtually no volume. Now, we actually got two big days here. This breakout on big volume, and that's where I bought it, and away it went. Uh, over the 10-year uh, yield debacle, uh, I had a losing trade in Neil. Uh, big deal. Uh, uh, now, this is WSM. This happened more recently. As you can see, uh, huge volume as it goes up here. And then it pulls back on falling. As soon as you see that, your head must go up, folks. And then that low, that low, just there, I hope you can see that, is exactly the same as those highs. And then we had a outside, big uh, hammer candle pattern there. Jerry does a wonderful course, folks, on candles. And then it sat here and didn't, didn't do much. And then it flew up. I'd never heard of the damn thing before. Uh, I had to phone some of the ladies in North Carolina. No. Ohio to ask what the thing made. And as you can see here, people are strumming for it. Uh, and it's still going sideways after that. Uh, but I got out up there. There was an exact Fibonacci extension up there. And that'll be my part of the uh, went to sell course because I firmly believe in both uh, Fibonacci levels uh, and they're most useful for exit. So if you're a swing trader and you're looking for uh, really, really accurate exit levels. Uh, the FIB levels are what the institutional players use, both for entry and for exit. And there's some uh, quite unique FIB levels that uh, are not in the public domain. The 78% level, for example, one of our customers uh, out in uh, Wales, uh, Cardiff, uh, Carwin, if you're listening, he calls me the 78% man because I use the 78% retracement uh, so often. I'll be speaking about that at the uh, when to sell course. Uh, whether you believe Fibonacci is sent on by God, it's absolute, or whether the levels only work because there's so many people looking at the levels, doesn't really matter. Uh, the levels work to the tick. Uh, and as you can see, this is going sideways and falling volume. I was quite interested in that. I haven't done anything. Uh, that's Rocky. And Rocky, as you can see, big volume goes sideways on falling volume. Then we had these two big days up and it went right back, kissed those lows and away she goes. I'll show you. Uh, I'm going to add uh, in the next slide. I've added earnings per share. Earnings per share is rising. That's the vector vest valuation. There's the two moving averages. I haven't put on the 89. So everything coming to the party. And in that period, uh, the DEW was positive. Uh, that was a, a good period for the DEW. Uh, this is sudden death. I'm holding food to. Uh, the, the, the growth fundamentals are OK on vector vest. Uh, the, uh, 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 this came back and it came back to this old high, as you can see. Uh, I bought it there and it came back. I got stopped out at entry. Um, I bought it again the other day because it's risen on rising volume going sideways on virtually no volume. And that's still the case. That's still the case. So I'm sitting uh, uh, in that trade, uh, sweating it out and you sweat it out many a time. Uh, so uh, I've been sweating out on a gold stock for the last month called Polymetal seems to be moving my way. What can you do? So that's that is a, a diagrammatically a pullback to the old high on falling volume. That's what we're looking for. I think 
I don't think you have to be uh, an action hero. You can wait for a candle pattern. Uh, and that hammer is as good as any. Uh, I like an outside day as well. Uh, uh, and uh, did you see the outside day in the gold market, folks? Two days ago, uh, outside day in the gold market, it goes up $50. Uh, so outside days are great. You could use them to trade on their own. In fact, there's a bloke in Chicago who's got a $3,000 course. It's an outside day. Uh, quite a well-known. Now this I'm very proud of because that was my first televised call. That was in South African television, SABC, uh, way back in about 1990. It's a gold mining stock. I told everybody to sit and wait to buy it just there. And the chap who interviewed me laughed at me. And then he had me on about a month later and the share was just here. And I told him to buy and it went from 29 South African rands to 120 South African rands in that move. Uh, so that was. Uh, 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 <laughs> this is LPX. There's a, you see the outside day, folks. Uh, it pulls back to that last old high. When you get home, have a look at the volume. There's the moving averages. Market was rising and that was the entry point just there. Stop loss there and it's now running up the page. Uh, so. Uh, this is Arc Best, and I have to go quick. Joey's telling me I'm running out of time. Uh, Square has been such a wonderful provider, folks. Uh, it's just been an outstanding stock during the course of 2020. Uh, and uh, that's uh, lovely. That again, if you come on, I think we talk about on the precision swing trading course, this huge uh, rounding bottom uh, uh, that broke up and kissed. Uh, so we can use a technical oscillator and the stochastic is as good as any. Uh, this uh, is a UK stock called Clipper uh, and it was in fact uh, brought to my attention by Nigel from Deal in Kent. Uh, and uh, as you can see, everything is saying yes and it pulled back here and the stochastic goes down below 20. But very importantly, the price is rising and the stochastic is falling. And that's called reverse divergence and it's predicting an extension of the trend. So that's that's uh, Clipper. Uh, that was great. And uh, we've got such a, a knowledgeable band of investors in the UK uh, over the last few years. Uh, the, the level of expertise has grown and gone through the roof at all our groups. That's square. That was last year. Look at the setup, folks. You've got this pulling back to that last old high. Earnings per share is rising. We need to look at the volume a little bit later. And the stochastic price is rising. The stochastic is falling. Clips up through 20, where she goes. And that was a huge move percentage wise. Uh, Rocky, we spoke about this a second ago. Uh, again, a, a part of an exceptionally good sector at the minute retail. Uh, and uh, it broke back to that last old high. Uh, it, it pulled back on really low volume in here. The stochastic gets right down below 20, where it goes. Huge volume coming into it now. Been some, uh, that was a great swing trade just about here. Yeah. And as you can see, earnings per share was rising as well. Uh, that's ARC best, uh, good stochastic setups. I haven't got time to go into the candle patterns, folks. Jerry's, Jerry uh, D'Ambrosio has got a wonderful course on candles with Vector Vest. I particularly like the outside days and the hammers. Piercing lines are not bad as well. Piercing line is, they used to call it, we call it for a lifetime a gap and snap. It's now called a piercing line. Progress. I think, folks, that knowing how much you risk on any one trade is vital. And before you can decide that, you need to work out how much money you're playing with. So decide how much money is in your account and then vow not to lose any more than 1% of that. And uh, the slides for the presentation are available, uh, but uh, that simple little mathematics will allow you to size your positions correctly. Just remember folks that if the share if you buy a share at 10 and the stop loss is at 8.50, when the share falls from 10 to 8.50, as swing traders, you need to run for the door quick. As it falls in cash out of your account, that one 
pound fifty, that one dollar fifty fall should represent one, maybe two percent of your account. Any more than that, and you're a gunslinger. Three or four bad ones in a row, and you're down big time. And uh, the power of one is incredible. If you use a 1% position sizing model, it takes 690 trades to run down $100,000 to $100. And if you use a 1% position uh, model, and you've got a two to one risk to reward ratio, it only takes 35 trades to double your money. So that's the power of one. I did those sums uh, maybe in the middle 80s. Uh, on a Hewlett Packard uh, calculator, and uh, I found them incredibly motivating at the time. Now, managing the trade is key, and exits are key. And as I say, I've been asked this question so many times. All of the presenters at Victor Vest have been asked this question so many times that we've decided to pull our resources and put together a course which is going to focus on all the parts of trading, but really highlight how to actually exit the position. Uh, a good way to start would be to split your position into two parts. When you've made as much as you've risked, take a sh quick profit on half, get your stop loss to entry, then let the other half run. So. Uh, if you buy a 10 and your stop loss is at 850, when the shares got to 1150, you've made as much as you risked. Bank half, let the other one run, and use the vector vest stop loss as a trailing stop loss. And that's one method in the course. We're going to suggest lots and lots of methods. I'll be talking primarily about a FIB methodology, which is particularly good for swing trades. Uh, I sold Microsoft at a FIB extension. Rocky, we would still be in, uh, got in, uh, and uh, it's emotionally quite easy because you, you, you get frequent positive uh, input in that uh, most of the trades will actually uh, go to first base, as I call it. But then only about 30 to 40 percent will turn into runners. Uh, so there's no targets, just allow the second half to run as long as it's above uh, the vector vest stop loss. A simple target is just an equidistant channel. That's something that you could uh, use. Uh, I find in this day and age that the FIB levels are actually more significant uh, than uh, the channel levels. And folks, the big secret uh, is quite simple. Uh, when you've got a winning trade, become optimistic and let it run. Um, when you've got a losing trade, become quickly pessimistic. You know, I, I, myself and my trading partner some years back, we analyzed many hundreds and tens of thousands of traders. And we found that the winning traders thought differently from the losing traders. The losing traders, when they had a winning trade, they became pessimistic. They became pessimistic that the market was going to snap back their profits. So they actually took it like a little Pac-Man. Those of you that are old enough to remember it. Uh, however, the losing traders, when they had a losing position, they became immediately optimistic. They said, it's going to turn. Give it another tick. Let's give it another day. So my challenge to you, ladies and gentlemen, is one, on your next trade, become aware of your thoughts. And your thoughts have got a huge amount of momentum. But become aware of your thoughts and do your best to become optimistic when the share moves your way and very pessimistic when the share moves against you. And our research showed that nine out of 10 traders get that the wrong way around. They become 
pessimistic with a winner and optimistic with a loser. I've run over once more, Joey. Uh, so I think that the, uh, Joey, Joey's going to put up that link for our new course, When to Sell. Uh, I'm busy working on it at the moment. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to it. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed my little talk. I could uh, quite easily rattle on here for two to three days. Uh, and uh, so please do your best to try and differentiate in your trading journal uh, between following your process and good or bad luck. Uh, when you have a winning trade, uh, do your best to become optimistic, to get focus on getting rid of those uh, negative thoughts and allow that position to run. Uh, when you, uh, in fact, get a losing position, become pessimistic very quickly indeed. That's the link. Uh, Ray Clark, who's the head of education, tells me that it'll never be any cheaper than $495. And he doesn't mince his words, okay? Never, ever, ever. Uh, folks, thanks very much indeed. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the two days.